Hello. Hi, is this Walter? Yes, it is. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our next guest this evening. He is a singer, guitarist, and songwriter who you probably remember his number one hit, Magnet and Steel. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Walter Egan to the show. You're on the air live with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with you, Tiffany. Thanks. You know, this is Terry, and that's my daughter Tiffany. I want to say hi, too. Uh, you are a perfect example of what I've been telling people. Everybody thinks that all the 70s had was disco music. There was some damn great love songs, and you had one of them. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yes, I was uh, kind of the anti-disco song there in 1978. <laughs> that, that I've been told that before. Yeah. Well, it was a great song, definitely an anthem for me. Uh, I really got a kick out of your video, because I actually looked up the old original video for Magnet and Steel, and it's kind of oh, shot. Wow. Yeah, I kind of. it was kind of shot in soft focus. First of all, damn, you were a good-looking guy, okay? And you were, like, playing into the camera, and it was all romantic-looking. I bet you got a lot of women after that video came out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was a good time. It was a good time for all of us. It was the 70s. Day, and he wow. had great um, hair. Thank you for that. Oh, yes. I still have my hair, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. Perfect. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, my grandmother thought I looked like a vampire in that uh, video. <laughs> really? That was way, way overly made up, and, uh, and I was suffering from oily smoke machine on my hair. But uh, yeah. other than that, it was great to do the stroll, and, uh, you know, it was a fun, a fun time. That song, uh, you know, outlived many things. Well, I, I must say, uh, at this event that we're publicizing, which is the uh, New York Fab 50, uh, I think you and our other friend, Tommy James, probably will have the best hair there. <laughs> because, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I did a thing with Tommy the Rock Con a few years ago, and uh, yeah, Tommy's looking good. He's looking good, and yeah, it's quite a lineup. I mean, I've, I've done shows with Marshall Crenshaw before. I love his stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, the Mickey Dolan's in there, man. That's too much. And then Gene Cornish, when I was, I grew up in New York City, and our band kind of modeled itself for a, for a time after the Rascals. And so Gene Cornish being there is really cool for me. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I think it's going to be great. Yeah, Marshall, not only is he a great singer, but God, he played a great Buddy Holly in that film. You compare his performance against Gary Busey, which was not really good. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he, Marshall to me was Buddy Holly. I've talked to people that knew Buddy and said it was totally right on. But uh, yeah, well, let's let's talk a little. Marshall. Let's talk about a little bit about your career, and and I don't know if people know this, but. Your first album uh, was actually produced by Lindsey Buckingham and Richard Deschut. Can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly. Um, actually, I did four albums for Columbia between 77 and 80. And the first album was actually produced by Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie, Stevie Nicks. Mm. And, of course, I was part of the production on all these albums. But, but, yeah, I mean, it was an interesting situation because that was... You know, they were still kind of going through their semi-bitter time between one another. And so I felt like I had to be some kind of a diplomat in the studio to, uh, you know, to play them off one another. But, uh, you know, it was amazing. And, of course, Stevie sang background on many of the songs on Fundamental Role. That was the first album. And, uh, you know, she was doing the background to this song of mine called Tunnel of Love. And I was driving home and... Uh, drove behind this car that had the license number, license plate said, not shy. And by the time I was home, I had written Magnet and Steel, which was definitely inspired by Stevie. So it was a kind of neat thing to be able to do that on the second album, which was called Not Shy. Right. And uh, and that was the one where uh, Richard Dashett and Lindsay were producing. And Stevie just took a, a role as doing some vocals on the album. Well, I, I know Lindsay, who was, you know, going with Stevie, and you said he was having uh, kind of muddy water at the time, a little bit of trouble here and there. But, you know, a lot of people that would hear that you kind of, like, was inspired by Stevie to do that song. Did you kind of have a crush on Stevie? Oh, very much so. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, was, uh, I was smitten by the kitten, you might say. Yeah. I mean, it was... She... You know, well, what do I have to say? I mean, everybody knows how attractive right. Stevie is. But at that time, you know, she was still 
actually, when I we kind of saw one another for about a month, actually, in 1976. And and when I first started taking her out, I said, you know, I, you have such an amazing voice that, you know, I have to just tell you. And she was, like, very kind of self-deprecating, going, really, do you think so? I mean, I was like, yeah, I think so, you know. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of a neat, uh, a neat time because, uh, you know, I mean, they had had some acclaim through the Buckingham Knicks record, mm -hmm. and... And then this was just as Rhiannon was about to break, so you know it was uh, it was a great time to be able to get to know them before the big machine took over in many ways. You know, you, you know she still is, is not shy. I admire her so much. I don't know if you talked to her recently or whatever, but there was some rumor going yeah. around that Lindsay Lohan was going to play her in a movie. She was like, "No, I don't approve that. I was never a crack whore." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. That was great. And she's in that American Horror show, yeah. um, or whatever that is. My daughter was telling me about it. She was like, you know, Stevie kind of comes in and sings a song or something. I don't know. So it's neat that she's so iconic, you know. It's, uh, she's transcended many generations with her talent. Well, you, you've and, done so much. Oh, it's Lindsay, for that matter. Oh, know? yeah, and sure. Lindsay is, uh, you know, a very special human being, I'd have to say. Well, you know, it's so cool that you're you're doing this Beatles thing, and it's really at, at a good time, because uh, at the time, it, you know, the announcement came out that uh, you, you have a new album, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, yeah. Myth America. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah. You're the first person I've heard say the title. I, I, was, I was looking forward to it so much. <laughs> um, yes, Myth America, it's, uh, you know, I've never really stopped writing and performing it. Uh, you know, in some ways, I feel like I'm the ultimate cult figure because people know me by that song, and yet I go and do writers' nights here in Nashville, and and they go, God, I love that song. You know, who did that? <laughs> yeah, I did. You know, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, who who recorded that? So it's kind of an interesting, surrealistic life that I lead that way. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it the Beatles thing is is such a thrill for me because I had grown up in New York City and I got to see them at Carnegie Hall in their first performance in New York. And actually I saw them also in Forest Hills and Shea Stadium after that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, this is going to be such a fun night. I'm just really looking forward to it. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit. I mean, definitely, we're going to talk more about the Beatles thing, but let's talk a little bit more about your album. I mean, that's supposed to be coming out in February, right? Right, February 11th. It's going to be a big week for me starting with this Beatles thing. Mm -hmm. Tuesday is when the album drops. It's, it's uh, going to be on this label called Classic Music Vault, mm. but it's available on all the platforms. It's actually order. You can pre-order it on Amazon now, I believe. So, and I'm really proud of it. I did it uh, in a small studio here, and uh, my drummer, Ron Krasinski, played drums on all the tracks, and I did basically everything else. And so it was kind of a, a time of, uh, having moved to Nashville, it's, it's a place where people have to co-write for everything, and, and I just, it's kind of the anti-Nashville album, I guess you might say. Not that it's, uh, you know, it's not putting Nashville down, but it's the uh, the opposite of Nashville. Right. Album. Everybody thinks that, that people in Nashville all sing country music. Like, for instance, the, the guest we had on our first guest night what, was Melanie, and I was so excited to talk to her. She lives in Nashville, mm -hmm. too. You know, I didn't even realize that. That's, yeah. Uh, that's pretty neat. Yeah. It, no, it's a very great music town. It's a great place to live and to uh, be based out of. You're kind of in the middle of the country so you get to do a lot of that but but yeah you know when i moved down here i thought uh, maybe i could uh, this was in the late 90s and i thought it was a good good time to uh, to jump over into country music and i played in a band called brooklyn cowboys and the burritos and burrito deluxe and i've done this kind of country rock stuff mm -hmm. but you know this is really what i love to do this rock kind of folk rock kind of stuff that I'm doing on Myth America. And, uh, and then also that week, on the 13th in Georgetown, D.C., I'm having a painting exhibit that's opening. I've, I've done paintings. Oh. I was an art major at Georgetown. 
and I've over the last few years I've done these paintings of the martyrs of rock and roll, and so uh, this is the opening for that, and I'm going to be playing playing kind of a happening show there in Georgetown. It's a place called Gypsy Sally's, which has a, a gallery space and a music venue as well. So it's going to be really fun. It's going to be very neat. Very cool. Well, you're you're multi talented, and 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 not not. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I have to embarrass Walter a little bit here. I mean, he's multi-talented. He's had a number one uh, song. He, he's a songwriter, a guitarist, a singer. He's a painter, and he even appeared on Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> you you were a contestant I, on Scrabble. I, I had a game show career there. I was on Scrabble <laughs> and uh, on Catchphrase, a short-lived yet uh, very entertaining show that was. Hosted by uh, Dennis James, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it was uh, I was aiming for Jeopardy, but I didn't quite make it to Jeopardy. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I did some funny stuff during the mid '80s. There, I also was an extra in a few movies. There's a movie called Eight Million Ways to Die. Mm. That I'm an extra in, and a TV movie called A Different Affair with mm. Ann Archer and. Uh, you know, it, it was around the time that my son was being born, my first child, and uh, it uh, was after I did the fifth album on on Backstreet Records, and uh, I had a song called Full Moon Fire mm-hmm. that got to, uh, you know, like the mid-30s on the charts. And then it, uh, there was an upheaval at Backstreet, and uh, Irving Azoff took over and decided my record wasn't going to go any farther because it was it was being championed by the guy who he ousted so it was a really a case of a uh, record business politics which is very kind of you know not attractive at all but uh you know but the video for that actually is on youtube if you look at it up it's called the song is called fool moon fire okay and it came out about nine months before thriller Mm-hmm. And yet, I think Thriller had uh, seen it. You, know, you judge for yourself. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it was, a, it was a cool thing. I turn well, into a werewolf. I go to a movie and take my date to a movie. <laughs> go running amok as a werewolf. Well, you know, it's, it's quite an exciting video. An- another song that gets mentioned a lot, and and just goes to show, you know, that Bag and Seal wasn't your only hit. They they call it a minor hit, but I wouldn't call it a minor hit. I think it was pretty known. That's Hot Summer Nights. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's it's uh, a funny thing about that song it's the most covered song i ever wrote there's been french and swedish and japanese versions of it and i only wrote it because at the end it was was supposed to be the oh the big uh, finale for the not shy album was supposed to be stevie's song sisters of the moon i had been doing a live version of that during the year when i was touring and of course got down to it and Lindsay was like no we're not going to do that you got to have another song but this is the big closer Lindsay please you know go home and write a song so basically he told me to go home and write a song and I wrote that song three chords and uh, recorded it the next day and then the amazing thing about that song is a few years ago Eminem used it for the uh, as the basis for his song We Made You so I'm listed as one of five writers on that Eminem song yeah, I was Bizarre. I was going to mention that. Probably another little piece of uh, Walter trivia is that you were listed as a co-writer on We Made You because of that song. And you know something, yeah. like, like he's really cool, okay, him and, and the Beastie Boys, which shows that white people can, can <laughs> you know, can rap. And <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess I'm square when I say that. I had a rapper friend over one time, and I'm like, yeah, I know all the rappers, Eminem and, and Run DMC and the BC Boys. He's like, you are so square. But but he, <laughs> to, to digress, okay. Yeah, well, a couple of guys from Queens there. The Run DMC is from Queens. I'm yeah. from Queens. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. There Fantastic. you go. A, yeah, you know, it's a crazy career. I've, I've had a lot of satisfaction. I mean, the early satisfaction was having... Basically, my last idol, Graham Parsons, record my song "Hearts on Fire" yes. before he died. Yeah, wow. and so that was a thrill. I could have just stopped right there and said, "Hey, this has been great," you know. And then I got to play with Spirit for three years as a bass player, which was really fun because I love their music, and so I got to know Randy California and Ed Cassidy. 
And then uh, when I was living in New York in the early 90s, I wound up playing guitar and singing with Randy and the Rainbows. Oh, and, you know uh, something? They were the last, they were the last doo-wop group to hit the top ten. Were, were you by their... chance involved with Denise? Well, only in the performance of it. Okay. I was singing the, smart, the falsetto in the 80s, not yeah. in the original one. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so that was really cool, and I've gotten to play with people like... Uh, you know, back to Wanda Jackson, a few shows, and she's a trip. Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, she's, she's still going I strong. Her. I mean, she's, yeah. uh, wow, and, and on fire. I, mean, I wouldn't get Yeah, well, fun. the first the first rehearsal I had with her, I was like, you know, kind of feeling my way through these songs. And she turns around to me and goes, Walter, you're not rocking hard enough. Come on. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. But, so, well, you know, I've so got to ask so. you, and there's so many things on the Internet that's wrong. You're talking about your game show thing. Now, here it says Chuck Woolery, and that's just not who you said was the host <laughs> of your game show. It says something about Chuck Woolery had asked you to sing a line because you introduced yourself as a singer-songwriter, and you sang a little bit of Magnet Steel. Is that right? Or is that totally wrong to mention Chuck? No, that's actually true. It's, uh, you know, you mentioned that I was a songwriter singer, and you said, well, do you have anything that I would know? And I said, well, I had a song, Magnet and Steel, got the number eight, you know, a couple of years ago. And, hmm, you know, I don't know if I know that. And then his announcer was named Charlie Tuna. Mm. Charlie Tuna was like a DJ as well. And, he and said, a legend. Oh, yeah, man, that was a big song. You don't know yeah. that one? Come on. Yeah, it was so... You know, so I did, you know, for you are me. You know, uh-huh. I did one of those for him. And right. he's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then, and, you know, he had this most amazing watch that I've ever seen. He had this, you know, it looked almost as big as his wrist, this, yeah. this watch. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, I don't know. He was a nice guy, you know. Of all the television people I've met, I mean, he's semi-genuine, uh, even though he's, you know, they're all on when they're on TV, but, uh, you know, he was all right, he was all right. Well, I know you, <laughs> I know you had mentioned uh, Graham Parsons, and I, and I wanted to ask you if you were still involved with this or if it was just kind of a one-time thing, but I know that you actually headlined the 13th annual Graham Parsons Guitar Pull and Tribute Festival in Georgia. Are you still involved with that yearly, or...? Um, yeah, they usually keep a rotation going. I should be up for going back there probably this year. It, uh, yeah, down there in Waycross, it's uh, pretty cool to uh, do that show. I mean, you know, I mean, Grant Parsons was a very important person, even though Chris Hillman was his partner in crime, if you want to put it that way, and kind of turning people who were... At, when the time, when they started doing country music seriously, anybody in a rock band would go, oh, man, that's too weird, you know, because everything was so polarized then. Mm-hmm. You know, the hippies were on one end and the, and the rednecks were on the other mm-hmm. end and nobody met in the middle. And so when they started doing this country music without doing it tongue-in-cheek, as, you know, maybe the Beatles when Ringo sang one or whatever, you know, it was like, oh, you know, this, this music, there's something to this beyond just the kind of caricature. And so uh, I think it's very important for that reason. And, and it's, of course, the pebble into the water that all the rings go out and you know americana today i think owes a lot to what graham and and chris did back then so it was you know it was an amazing thrill for me to have him sing one of my songs and and actually actually the first time he sang with emmy lou was in my kitchen they needed a place to sing when they first got together and i said well come on my kitchen so (laughs) that was pretty cool for me well, yeah, you, you yeah. obviously must be a little bit more impressed by people because we were talking to Melanie and she got to perform on stage with John Lennon and she said that she wasn't didn't really realize. I mean, she knew he was big, but he was just a guy and he flirted with her and Yoko got jealous and gave her a black rose. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's she, great. Said she never knew what yeah. that meant, but I got a feeling I know what it meant. Uh, but, but yeah, it, the thing I wanted to mention too, and I mentioned we saw your video for Magnet and Steel and you got the group there with you. Now, I always knew that you were perceived as a solo artist, but it almost looked like it was a group the way they were all there in unison with you. Yeah, you know, I've always been in groups, and I even the way I got my deal was doing a hoot night at the Troubadour with a group called The Wheels. Not the Detroit Wheels, but The Wheels. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, and they offered the deal to me instead of the band, and that, that was really weird for me because I always had people who I thought sang better than I did in bands, and and I always I love playing in bands, so I've always, even though I've had sidemen as my band, I've always tried to make it feel as if it were a band, and that band, I kept them together for quite a while. That was a really good bunch of guys. Man, so, so yeah, I mean, it was really it was a band. Basically, you're you're saying that you were a band, but they wanted the name on the record to be Walter Egan. That had to be really uncomfortable for you. Well, it was when I was offered the deal instead of the band because I was actually sleeping on their couch at the time. So it was really kind of a semi-awkward thing, but they seemed to understand. And then when people knew that the deal, that I had signed the deal, it, it didn't really come into play. It was like, you know, they expected to be sidemen, and I treated them better than sidemen. Yeah. You know, and when I do gigs with my band here in Tennessee, you know, I just basically split the profits four ways. I don't, uh, I don't make it into a big deal. I like, I like feeling like a band. And even though it is most of my stuff, you know, I want their contribution and I want the, the kind of attention that they pay to the music right. that comes from feeling like they're in a band, you know, oh. rather than just kind of phoning it in. As far as the record label's decision, I'm, I'm sure it was not only your, your great voice, and, and like you said, though, they all sang great, too, but y you had the best hair, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, and I guess I thank my father for that, too. <laughs> so, this show for a while. do you, know this whole thing that, that you're going to be at now is, is in commemoration to the Beatles having landed in America and, and taken over, and when you had Magnet Steel, that was a 70s hit, it was kind of at the end of the Beatles' career, uh, did you have any run-ins with any of the Beatles then or even now with Paul and Ringo that's left with us? Well, actually, I've run into two of the Beatles. And um, I met Ringo on a plane at during that time, actually. He was on Columbia at the same time I was. And so we happened to both be on a plane to England or back from England or something. And it was one of these 747s with the lounge above. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and someone came down and said, come on upstairs and meet Ringo. I said, oh, okay, cool. So, you know, we had kind of nice little small talk for a little bit. It was really nice. He's a, he's a really cool guy. And then uh, my other encounter was that I was getting gas. I was pumping my gas at the corner of Beverly Glen and Ventura Boulevard at a 76 station. And this tan, camel-colored Mercedes 230 or 280, whatever those smaller ones, the two-seater ones, pulls in, and out gets George Harrison, and he starts pumping his gas across, oh my the, God. across the aisle from me. I was like, hey, you know, hey, you know, I like, it was, it was such an amazing moment, such a surrealistic moment, and you know, and he sort of looked at me, and I looked at him, and I just kind of gave him a nod and a wink, you know, kind of, rather than, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be uncool, and yeah. now I wish... I had, you know, I wish I had spoken to him or whatever, but, so yeah, that was my other run-in with the Beatles, and, uh, you know. Well, you know, I, I originally... See, Walter's way cooler than I, because I would have been like, yeah. oh, can I go pump your gas for you, Mr. Harris? Well, you, <laughs> you, you just changed my whole impression of them, because I always felt sorry for Ringo, because nobody ever gives Ringo any respect. He's like, oh, he just replaced that first guy, and he's just a drummer. Ringo can sing, first of all. I love Ringo stuff. But George had to pump his own gas. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, he was, you know, a self-made man. Yes. Yeah, I've been reading this new book that's called Tune In. It's like 800 pages of Beatle trivia, basically. I mean, it's this minutia of their lives up until the end of 1962. That's only the first volume. <clears throat> and I've read, like, about 600 pages of it now. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing because their image is so much the... Oh, they're the, you know, the clean lads as opposed to the dirty stones kind of thing. And they were the, <laughs> the popish one. Yeah. But they were really R&B, and they were really yeah. kind of nasty guys yeah, for yeah. a while. And, and, um, <clears throat> and, of course, Ringo, you know, was like the top drummer in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, you know, well sought by all these other Liverpool groups. So, yeah, you know, it's funny how the perception over the years happens, but... Uh, you know, the uh, right. 
Gringo is as legendary as any of those guys. Absolutely. I mean, the four of them, you know. So what are you going to do with the show? I, I take it you're probably going to be doing Magnet and Steel. I, I heard from Ron Dante, talked to him before we're going to have him on tonight, that, that everybody is also doing a Beatles song. Are you doing a Beatles song? Yeah, we each get to do a Beatles song in our own hit, I guess. Um, and maybe those who have more than one get to do more than one hit. But, yeah, I'm doing uh, the one after 909. Oh, okay. Oh. One, of the, one of the first John Lennon songs that uh, eventually appeared on the Let It Be album. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I love the early stuff. I love the, you know, the beginnings of, of groups. You know, it seems to hold true for all the all the acts that I really like. The first two or three albums are always the ones that I like the most. And this being, like, the, I think he wrote this about his first wife, about Cynthia, mm -hmm. and getting on a train to to come to town or something so yeah i mean i get to do that and i'm looking forward to it well as we kind of wrap this up we want to remind all of our listeners to uh definitely head out to america celebrates the beatles it's going to be happening on february 8th in new york city i'll give the uh website address in a minute but in the meantime we also want to remind everybody to check out myth america which is walter's new album it's coming out on february 11th and i understand people can actually pre-order it now right that's correct on Amazon. Yes. Perfect. And are, you're not going to have. Are you going to have any of the albums by chance at the show? Or yes, I will. I, I've gotten my box of them, so I'm going to bring them. And so I don't know how the merch tables are going to be set up there, but I'm sure I will find out when I get there. But yeah, I, I'll have them there, and I'll have also my what's called the collection, which are my first four albums, the four on Columbia including Magnet and Steel and Hot Summer Nights. So I've got to ask, so, are, are you going to have any vinyl there? Because you might have some kids that don't know what those are. <laughs> uh, I wish I did. I, I mean, I have, you know, I have a few copies left of yeah. the albums, the vinyl. But, um, yeah, it, you know, I think it's making a comeback. It's a slow comeback, but even my daughter wants to buy a turntable, and she's 19. And my son actually lives in Brooklyn, so he's going to come to the show, and he has been like a DJ through the years. And great. So, I have a great history of vinyl. In our family. Awesome. <laughs> it, it really helps out, Walter, when you're putting out new records to have a son as a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, once again, we remind all of our listeners to check out the website, nycfab50.com, uh, so that you can find out all the details about the lineup for America Celebrates the Beatles, which is going to be happening on February 8th. And, uh, Walter, it is. Well, been wait, just a minute. What about uh, Walter? Do you have a website yourself? I do, uh, walteregan.com. Okay, perfect. And uh, you can find me on Facebook as well. All right. Perfect. So, and uh, Walter, yeah, of and all thank the, you, Terry and Tiffany. I appreciate it. Of all the of all the people we had on tonight so far, Walter has the most fan sites on the internet. <laughs> really? There are so many Walter Egan fan sites on the internet. It's amazing. Well, I, I'll I'm, tell you, I'm it, you. It, it's all that magnet steel video because <laughs> when you looked into the camera with a soft focus. Now, I'm I'm very heterosexual, but I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Romance, because... Well, I appreciate that, Terry, and uh, I like to think I still get the magic, too. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you run into Stevie next, tell her a good decision on Lindsay Lohan, because Lindsay Lohan is not qualified to pump her gas. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, it's been a lot of fun, Walter, uh, and uh, keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on in the future at any time. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Terry and Tiffany. All right. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye.